Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Gwen Jacobson, COVID hair and all. I'm one of many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NAC TV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 12, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. This week's Nipawa Banner and Press is dated Friday, January 8th, 2021. Not a long paper this week. The front page shows a young man alongside his dog Sadie starting off 2021 with a skate along a section of cleared off ice on a frozen dugout just southwest of Nipua on January the 4th. There are many, many backyard rinks and ponds being cleared off with COVID being on set right now. New Year's baby born at Nipua Health Centre. <coughs> the first baby of 2021 delivered at Nipua Health Centre was born this week. Lorianne Joni Kleinsasser was born on January 5th at 3.37 a.m. to dad Paulus and mum Elaine Kleinsasser. At birth, she weighed 6 pounds 13 ounces and was 18 inches long. Laurie-Anne is the little sister to four siblings, 8-year-old Alana, 7-year-old Gabriel, 6-year-old Adrian, and 3-year-old Kelvin. The family is from the Newdale area. Every year, the New Year's baby born in Nipua is gifted a quilt made by the Nipua Quilters Guild. A picture of the New Year's baby was not available. And COVID-19 updates. New 28-day personal care home immunization campaign. The province of Manitoba has launched a 28-day campaign to immunize all eligible personal care home residents in 135 sites across the province with the first dose of the vaccine. The personal care home immunization campaign will begin on Monday, January 11th. Over the week, focused immunization teams will visit seven locations in every regional health authority across the province. The province has developed a week-by-week -week plan to immunize an estimated 9,834 people living in personal care homes across the province. They will receive their first dose of vaccine within 28 days of the campaign launch, as long as the vaccine continues to be delivered to Manitoba by the federal government as expected. The schedule will then be immediately repeated to provide the second dose to all personal care home residents. Immunizations are expected to use the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. For COVID fines dated December 28th to January 3rd, a total of 279 warnings and 55 tickets were issued for the week of December 28th, 2020 to January 3rd, including 49 $1,296 tickets to individuals for various offenses and six tickets to individuals for failure to wear a mask in indoor public place. Officials advise that 41 of the 55 $1,296 tickets issued last week were in relation to gatherings in private residences. Manitobans are reminded that public health orders remain in effect and must be followed to reduce the spread of COVID-19. Since enforcement efforts began in April, a total of 1,962 warnings and 672 tickets have been issued, resulting in more than $984,000 in fines to businesses and individuals. For active COVID-19 case counts, 
Over the course of a recent seven-day period from Thursday, December 31st to Wednesday, January 6th, there have been 56 new COVID-19 cases reported within the Prairie Mountain Health Region. The total cases in the Prairie Mountain since March 2020 are 1,588, with 1,391 of those recovered and just 163 currently active. There have been 34 deaths in the region. Porcupine Mountain, located north of Swan River, has the most active cases in the region with 76. Brandon has 32 active cases, while White Mud, which encompasses Nipua and surrounding communities, has an active count of only two. The Winnipeg region currently has the most active COVID-19 cases with 2,630. The next article says Crocacol, Crocacurl rink being built in Nipua. A whimsical winter hybrid sport is making its way to Nipua. Over the course of the holidays, town staff have been working on the installation of a Crocacurl rink at the flats. For those who are unfamiliar with this uniquely Canadian game, Crocacurl combines elements of curling with the board game Crocanole. It was invented in Winnipeg in 2016 and has slowly but steadily gained popularity across the nation. The basic rules of Croca Curl consist of teams trying to score points by throwing rocks of similar size and shape to a curling stone into the center of the ice where the circles are marked. The button is worth 20 points and each ring outside of that is worth 15, 10 and 5 points respectively. Marilyn Crew, the Economic Development Officer for the Town of Nipawa, said that the idea of bringing the game to town has been in discussion since 2019. She noted that the timing and financials, for one reason or another, just didn't come together until now. We decided that this is the year to see if we could make it happen, and several things aligned for us to make this a reality. The Beautiful Plains Community Foundation received two rounds of grant funding through the Canadian Foundation with money from the federal government. So I looked at the opportunity that this presented and formally applied for a $3,000 grant from the Community Foundation and that was accepted, Crew said. Crew added that some of the metal work that is required for the playing surface was donated by Tridicon. She said the town is appreciative of that generosity received from the company. Construction of the playing surface, which is normally 15 meters wide, began in mid-December. The foundations have been put in place. In the coming weeks, the crocodile style posts required for the game will be erected and the rings will be painted. The Nipua Curling Club has offered its assistance in getting the rings put in place, painted on the surface. Crew said that it's been, a fantas it's been fantastic seeing some many groups come together to make this happen. Crew also noted to the Banner and Press that a sign will be placed on the location indicating the rules for those who want to try it out but are new to the game. She said that they're making arrangements for accessible rocks. The game is designed to be used with true curling rocks. We can't do that but we're creating a similar type of weighted items that will be able to slide on the surface similar to a curling stone. The rocks will be left at the location for anyone to use with the honour system in place for their use. Crew said that the town are very much looking forward to seeing what the public response is to this endeavour. We're hopeful that once it's in, all in place, we'll get a couple of months of good use out of it. It's something I think people will, will really be able to enjoy, a family-friendly activity that still adheres to the current social distancing practices. History with the Beautiful Plains Museum, the Dominion Post Office in Nipua. Above is pictured uh, Nipua's old post office, located at 341 Mountain Avenue. The Dominion Post Office building, as it was then called, was originally built in 1909 and housed both the post office and a local customs office. The customs office was housed here until 1921 and the post office until 1971. It is known today as Team Electronics. And in this picture, 
It shows the interior of the old post office with staff at attention for the photographer. This photo also appeared in a past edition of the Nipois Press as a submitted photo in which the bearded gentleman on the right was identified as John Lee. No other staff were named. According to the entry, Lee was the great-grandfather of the submitter, Gervin Greasley. The photo is also suspected of being taken by a Mrs. Stevens Mason of Nipois. <clears throat> and this article is by Rita Friesen, named No Resolutions Here. Remember when it was popular to make New Year's resolutions? Perhaps it is still? It was as if starting a new calendar enabled us to start fresh. As I have aged and hopefully matured, every day is now that gift and I utilize it to the max. Thought getting older would make it easier to be kind and gentle and good. You know, all those goals one has for life. Well, that was shot down years ago when I asked a mentor, many years my senior then, and about the age I am now, if it did indeed get easier to be good as one aged. With her characteristic smile and wit, she said, no, but I keep hoping. And so it is for me. For the first time in decades, I have embarked on an assisted journal. There are cues and questions to begin each page, and we are entitled to date the page there by moving at our own speed and discretion. Don't feel like addressing the book. Wait. Forgot a day. Forgive. I like that. One of the thought-provoking quotes, deal with people you can learn from and welcome those who can learn from you. I have been able to learn from people of all ages. Mr. Jacob Bergen, father of many, educated his two oldest children and they in turn educated their younger siblings. All but the youngest earned degrees, the youngest choosing to take over the farm. He spoke German and I English and we connected easily. He was elderly when he was still planting trees, fruit trees. He was showing me the apple sapling growing in the pit of a decayed tree. I wondered aloud why he was still planting trees when he would not likely live to eat the fruit. With a twinkle in his wise old eyes, he assured me that his grandchildren would certainly enjoy the apples. And isn't that what so many of us want, a better world for our children and grandchildren? My youngest daughter was 10 when I became a grandmother, and I admit I went a little gaga over the event. I have always loved babies, knowing they become children and then adults. One day, my daughter took me to task. You know, Mama, that whatever you do for this grandchild, you will be expected to do for all the others. Yikes, out of the mouths of children. I can't say I thanked her at the time, but certainly have many times since then. My paternal grandmother was looking intently at a photo in my parents' china cabinet. The image was of a stately matron, held, head held high, forward-looking, wearing a beflowered pillbox hat. Standing beside her, I commented, That's you, Grandma, with a slight shrug and an embarrassed chuckle with her German accent. I taught it was the Queen. Laugh at oneself when necessary. Looking back, I have been influenced and mentored by a wide variety of individuals. They have all enriched my life and widened my view. I don't know, know yet if I have had an impact on many others. I trust I have. May those who remember my silliness and oddities also recall fondly my strengths. I think I'll read the thumbs up, thumbs down this week. There's quite a few of them. Thumbs down to the person or persons in the red car who stole my inflatable snowman on Sunday evening, December 20th, from my front yard. It was given as a gift from my grandchildren who all love to see the snowman as they would drive by. Thank you to the, a thumbs up, thank you to the business community of Nipua, the Hand Office, Salvation Army, and the Kinsmen for the lovely Christmas goodie bags. How very kind of you, and also thanks to the jolly folks who organized, assembled, and delivered the pre-Christmas packages. Thumbs up from the Hillcrest Estate residents. Thank you for the new signage. It's progress. But thumbs down to whoever clears the streets. Hillcrest Street streets look disgusting. Let's clear the streets and get ready for winter. 
Thumbs up to the staff of the Nipua Hospital for the helpful, kind, and professional care I received from March 27th to the middle of October. Whenever I came in, day or night, the staff was always willing to help. Without their help, I don't know what I would have done. Thanks again. Thumbs up to the lady in Glenella who came to my door and dropped off cookies and fruitcake. They were delicious. I just wanted her to know that she brightened my Christmas. A thumbs up and thanks to the Christmas Dinner Committee, volunteers, local businesses, children for the lovely assortment of goodies, prayers, etc. I was overwhelmed as I thought of all of you put into something that would mean so much to me. May God bless you all. Thumbs up to Gladwin Scott for highlighting youth who are using their abilities and opportunities in so many positive ways. Thumbs up in quotation marks to snowmobilers who asked permission from rural property owners prior to crossing their lands. Respect for others is a key of civilized society. P.S. You might be inclined to suspect that the second thumbs up is dripping with sarcasm. And finally, thumbs down to the people in charge of cleaning sidewalks. <laughs> and out of Helen Drysdale's kitchen, her topic is pork tenderloin this week. Manitoba's pork industry has a website with information on the pork industry, the benefits of eating pork, and recipes. The following information is taken from this site. Pork is a powerhouse of nutrition. Every bite provides high quality protein, energy and key vitamins and minerals. Pork is also naturally low in sodium and saturated fat. Pork is loaded with important B vitamins including B6 and B12. Your body depends on daily replenishing of B vitamins to function properly. Pork is the leading food source of thiamine. Thiamine helps convert food into energy, regulate appetite, and maintain the normal function of the nervous system, heart, and muscles. Pork is the best meat source of riboflavin, which helps keep your nervous system, skin, and eyes healthy. Pork is an excellent source of selenium, a mineral that acts like an antioxidant by helping prevent and repair cell damage. Pork is a good source of iron, an essential mineral for the body since it helps maintain healthy red blood cells. Pork delivers a good supply of magnesium and phosphorus. Both minerals help to strengthen bones and teeth. Pork loin is a favorite of mine and it is easy to put together and impressive enough to feed company. Roast the loin with the fat cap on top to help keep the moist, the meat moist. Some cooks roast pork to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. However, I prefer a slightly higher temperature. And she goes on and has two delicious recipes for pork tenderloin and an apple and onion side dish. Community leaders discuss past year. The world has made it through another year and many are reflecting on the highlights and hardships of 2020. Community leaders from the municipalities of Harrison Park and McCreary and the towns of Carberry and Minidosa looked back on how the previous year went for them and forward to what they hope the coming year will have in store. Some good things in 2020. While many were more than happy to bid 2020 good riddance, there were some good things to come out of the year well, 2020 was a crazy year for everybody, expressed Harrison Park Reeve, Jason Potter. He says, I think the most positive thing that came out of it for our municipality was our council coming together to work through the extraordinary challenges that we all faced. Lorna French, CAO trainee for McCreary, noted that their community also came together through the year's challenges. She said the residents of the municipality of McCreary have been amazing at coming together during the year, supporting their local businesses, volunteering as restrictions allow, and remaining safe for our community. We would like to thank all of our community members for their ongoing understanding and diligence to follow public health orders and continue to keep our community safe and support local. 
communities were also able to get some infrastructure and construction work finished this year. The mayor of Carberry, Stuart Olmsted, uh, said construction on Carberry's new fire hall addition was completed this past spring. Several paving projects were undertaken around town. The long-awaited walking path along First Avenue was built and has seen record use. The Carberry Plains Community Centre has also undergone a major interior facelift and upgrade to the facility. Cindy Marzoff, CAO for Minnedosa, noted on behalf of Mayor Pat Scatch that the community accomplished groundbreaking for a new residential housing development, as well as completed new infrastructure upgrades to Centennial Drive. French added that McCreary has also completed some infrastructure repairs. Biggest challenge easy to guess. All the communities agreed that COVID-19 was considered the biggest challenge of the year. In Minnedosa, however, they had another issue hit them in 2020. Damaging after effects of the extensive rainfall event and flooding and the pandemic have had and continue to have enormous impacts in our community, Marzoff noted, adding that there is still damage from the flood that needs to be prepared. And looking forward to 2021, the coming year will no doubt have its own challenges, but that hasn't stopped these community leaders from looking forward with optimism. Olmsted noted, through 2021, we will continue to invest in both hard infrastructure, like those projects I have mentioned, as well as soft infrastructure, like people and programs to sustainably grow the Carberry community throughout this new decade. As with any growth, there will be challenges that arise that we will face, overcome, and emerge from stronger than before. In Minnedosa, Marzoff cited a number of projects they will be undertaking. She said, in 2021, we look forward to working on repairing flood damaged sites, continuing the work on the development of residential lots, extending the Minnedosa campground for additional campsites, pavilion upgrades, Lake Minnedosa weeds and water quality, formation of a new recreation model. We are also excited to have the community involved in developing new trails for recreational activities and the construction of a replica CPR station in the Heritage Village. The municipality of McCreary is looking forward and wanting to continue to make improvements to the municipality for the upcoming year 2021 through improved infrastructure continuous maintenance of municipal areas such as Fletcher Park, roads and culverts, the streets and sidewalks, municipal buildings, and local improvements to areas as needed, stated French. Council would also like to see areas, including our own, receive improved and reliable internet and cell service. Potter stated, I'm looking forward to returning to some sort of normalcy. The biggest thing that I missed was not being able to interact with the Harrison Park rate, rate payers as much as I would have liked. This will be this council's third budget process, so I'm excited about that. We have some big plans and announcements, announcements that will be coming out shortly in the new year. I welcome 2021 with open arms, he expressed. It has been an interesting two years so far, and I'm excited about the next two. Time flies when you're having fun, he says. And this article, Santa to a Senior Project, a huge success in Gladstone. Gladstone Area Senior Support created a new project this fall called Se Santa to a Senior. This project was fairly similar to other ones you may know of, including one put on by Winnipeg's A&O. Community members had time to call in to the office to either nominate an older adult in the community to receive a gift and or register themselves as a Santa. Everything was kept very confidential. There's no telling the senior who nominated them. Santas were then able to either offer a monetary donation or for those who were comfortable and able to, given a list of items to purchase. We wanted to focus on items that everyone needs in order to keep things confidential and a surprise. We couldn't exactly go to the nominated inv individual and ask them what they needed or preferred, mentioned the coordinator of services, April. 
uh, items on the list that could be purchased included but were not limited to personal hygiene items such as body wash, deodorant, soaps, shampoo and conditioner, lotions, socks, mittens, activity books and treats of any sort as long as they were not homemade around the value of approximately 10 to 15 dollars. Once the items were gathered they were dropped off at the GASSP office to then be screened and further distributed. For those who weren't comfortable going shopping, GASSP then purchased the items. In total, over 90 gifts were distributed to older adults in the Gladstone town and area, proving to be a very successful first attempt. The results really shocked all of us here. We are so humbled that not only was this project so successful, but humbled by the amount of people getting involved to spread holiday cheer to our older adults, said April. It has been a challenging year, keeping isolated seniors involved and being creative in delivery methods when the in-person opportunities cannot take place. GASSP is very thankful to everyone who got involved this year and is excited to bring the project back again next holiday season. And the Pallister government has had a government shuffle, so we are going to go through that. It's a brand new year, and with it comes some brand new job titles for some Manitoba MLAs in Premier Brian Pallister's cabinet. On Tuesday, January 5th, a ceremony was held at the legislature swearing in nine ministers, including three first-time cabinet members. The new cabinet will be composed of 18 members, six of which are female, the largest number since the government was elected in 2016. As we begin a new year and enter a new phase of addressing the significant challenges posed by COVID-19, it is time to present a renewed Team Manitoba to lead our efforts to protect Manitobans and create opportunities, said Pallister. Our strong team has a clear focus on helping working families, seniors and vulnerable Manitobans, protecting our health and education systems and setting the groundwork for a sustained economic recovery by creating job opportunities. The MLAs that were sworn into new portfolios included a trio of first-time cabinet members. The first is Wayne Iwasco, MLA for Lactabani, enters cabinet and as Minister for Advanced Education, Skills and Immigration. Next, Audrey Gordon, MLA for Southdale, enters cabinet as the first ever Minister for Mental Health, Wellness and Recovery. And Derek Johnson, MLA for Interlake Gimli, enters cabinet as Minister for Municipal Relations. Returning cabinet members who are shifting from one post to another include Calvin Gertsen, MLA for Steinbach, becomes Deputy Premier and Minister of Legislative and Public Affairs and retains his role as Government House Leader. Heather Stephenson, MLA for Tuxedo, becomes Minister of Health and Seniors Care. Ralph Eichler, MLA for Lakeside, becomes Minister of Economic Development and Jobs. Cliff Cullen, MLA for Spruce Woods, becomes Minister of Education. Cameron Friesen, MLA for Morden Winkler, becomes Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Rochelle Squires, MLA for Rial, becomes Minister of Families as well as Minister Responsible for Francophone Affairs. Ministers whose portfolio responsibles have not changed are Ron Schuler, Minister of Infrastructure, Blaine Peterson, Minister of Agriculture and Resource Development, Eileen Clark, Minister of Indigenous and Northern Relations, Kathy Cox, Minister of Sports, Culture and, and Heritage, Scott Fielding, Minister of Finance, Jeff Wharton, Minister of Crown Services, Reg Halwer, Minister of Central Services, and Sarah Gilmard, Minister of conservation and climate. Next is the Spruce Plains RCMP report from December 28th to January 3rd by Corporal Jacob Stanton. 
During the week of December 28th to January 3rd, Spruce Plains RCMP dealt with 54 police activities. On December the 28th, RCMP conducted COVID compliance checks in Minnedosa and Riding Mountain. All persons were found to be abiding by regulations. Police responded to a residential alarm in Nipah, which was later determined to be false. Police also assisted with a non-suspicious sudden death in Gladstone. December 29th, RCMP responded to a 911 hang-up call in the RM of North Cypress Langford. It was discovered that a child called 911 because he was bored. <laughs> The child was educated on the importance of using 911 for emergencies only. Police received a report of a dangerous driver in the RM of Minto Odonna, who, after patrolling the area, could not be located. Police attended the scene of a two-vehicle accident in Ipua, which was caused by slippery road conditions, but there were no reported injuries. December 30th, RCMP were dispatched to a vehicle fire in the RM of Rosedale. There were no injuries and the vehicle was towed off the road. Police received a 911 call, hang up call in Minnedosa, which was later determined to have been dialed accidentally. December 31st, RCMP received a report of a vehicle purchase, which was later discovered to have been stolen. The matter is still under investigation. Police issued tickets in Plumas and the RM of Rosedale to persons ab found not abiding by public health orders. Police received a report of fraud in Arden and a hit and run to a vehicle in Plumas. Both matters are still under investigation. January 1st, RCMP responded to a tractor fire in the municipality of West Lake Gladstone. The fire was not considered suspicious and there were no injuries. Police received reports of fraud and a suspicious person in Minnedosa. Both did not have sufficient evidence to proceed further. January 2nd, RCMP conducted various proactive traffic enforcement engaging with several motorists. January 3rd, RCMP responded to a residential alarm in Nipua that was later determined to be false. Police issued several tickets to drivers who were found speeding. RCMP conducted 23 traffic enforcement actions during this reporting period. If you have any information about these crimes or any other crimes, please contact your local RCMP office or Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the Nipua and Minidosa RCMP detachments advise they will be limiting front counter services at the detachments until further notice. We request that you contact each de detachment at Nipua 204-476-7340 or Minidosa 204-867-2916 to inquire about criminal record checks or to file a report. Leave a message if needed and it will be checked the following business day. Do not leave a message if you require immediate police assistance. You must dial Nipua 204-476-7338 Minidosa 204-867-2751 or 911 to have a police officer respond to you promptly. And there's a picture here of a moose who's been spotted at Lake Irwin quite a bit around Christmas time. There was a lot of people discussing this moose sighting. It's also been reported being seen around the Riverside Cemetery in Nipua. <clears throat> Top 5 MPI Frauds of 2020 Revealed While the COVID-19 pandemic disrupted much of normal goings-on in our province, fraudsters didn't miss a beat in their efforts to defraud Manitoba Public Insurance, or MPI, and its customers. This year's top five fraud list highlights bogus claims, the effective use of forensic tools, and astute MPI staff. MPI releases its annual top five fraud list to raise awareness about the costs related to auto insurance fraud, about $50 per customer yearly, said MPI's Chief Operating Officer Curtis Wenberg. The list is compiled based on the unique circumstances of each fraud, financial savings to MPI ratepayers, 
and investigative excellence in unearthing the fraudsters. Anyone with information about auto insurance fraud is engaged to call the Manitoba Public Insurance Tips Line 204-985-8477 or toll free 1-877-985-8477. All calls are anonymous. Suspicious claims are handled by MPI's Special Investigation Unit or SIU. As of the end of this November, claim savings are more than $13 million, with the SIU closing nearly 1,000 suspicious investigations. So, number one, burning up debt. The insured made a claim with MPI, reporting that his new travel trailer had been stolen out of a storage yard located within a community in rural Manitoba. That same morning, the travel trailer was found 10 kilometers outside of town, burned to the ground and still smoldering on a gravel road. MPI's SIU investigator immediately went to the burn site where he took photos and began determining the likely route taken by the thief. While traveling back to his office, an investigator noticed a building which had a surveillance camera pointing towards the highway. The surveillance footage showed the trailer being towed around midnight by a pickup truck which closely resembled the same year and model of the trailer's owner. The investigation also revealed the trailer's owner was experiencing financial issues. During the interview with the SIU investigator, the insured denied having any involvement with the theft. However, he was not allow, willing to allow MPI access to his truck, so the investigator could download data from it, which would help to determine where the vehicle was on the night of the theft. A few days after that interview, the insured contacted MPI and withdrew his claim, signing a waiver of release. Estimated, estimated claim savings to MPI was $37,000. Number two, creative accounting. After being injured in a crash, the woman eventually returned to her job on a part-time basis unable to work full-time due to lifting and other physical demands. However, she was entitled to receive MPI's Income Replacement Indemnity Entitlement, or IRI, which was calculated specifically from submitted income tax documentation. As time passed, an MPI IRI calculator noticed an irregularity in a letter and email allegedly coming from an accounting firm which the woman had submitted. After a conversation with the accounting firm, it was confirmed both the email and, later, and letter were fabricated and false. Investigators then did an extensive review and discovered numerous anomalies relating to the woman's income tax information. It was noted that many of the documents appeared to have been deliberately edited and included entries that were misaligned, entries in varying sized fonts, incomplete and incorrect field entries, wrong totals, and in two different years she reported the exact same income to the cent. <laughs> With all this information, the woman's benefits were terminated resulting in an estimated savings to MPI and its customers of nearly $800,000, a figure based on future payouts. MPI is also seeking to recover $100,000. Number three, Waskily Wabbit. The driver claimed a rabbit suddenly popped out of the bushes and ran in front of his vehicle. Startled, the driver said he applied the brakes and while attempting to avoid the little animal, crashed head-on into a light standard. The vehicle sustained extensive front-end damage. However, the driver's story had a number of irregularities which caught the attention of a seasoned SIU investigator. The investigation revealed the man, 20 years old, was experiencing significant financial issues exasperated by a large vehicle payment. A download from the vehicle's crash data recorder showed the vehicle was accelerating at the time of the crash, contradicting the man's story that he was braking before he hit the pole. With all the evidence in hand, the claim was denied. Claim savings to MPI and his customers, $31,000. Number four, 
Number four, Mr. Volunteer. The man claimed he was physically unable to do his demanding physical labor job after getting into a collision. He soon began receiving income replacement payments from MPI. However, as the months moved on, an MPI case manager began to have suspicions about their claimant. The file was then forwarded to MPI's SIU. The investigation revealed Mr. Volunteer, age 33, regularly worked at a Winnipeg retail outlet, including assisting customers. Unbeknownst to Mr. Volunteer, he actually served an MPI investigator and several others who were doing surveillance. When confronted with all this information, Mr. Volunteer denied he was working, but explained he was volunteering his services. The man's benefits were terminated, resulting in an estimated savings to MPI and its customers of nearly $300,000. And finally, number five, never know who's watching. After being involved in a crash, the Winnipeg man claimed he was too traumatized to drive and even had trouble being a passenger. Combined with the number of physical injuries, the man could not resume his job as a real estate agent and began receiving income replacement benefits. As time moved on, several irregularities began to surface for the MPI case manager, who then moved the file to MPI's SIU. The subsequent investigation, which involved surveillance, revealed that the man had returned to his job as a real estate agent, regularly showing our houses to clients, dealing with contractors on various renovation sites, and driving to all parts of the city, showing no signs of distress. On one occasion, the case manager called the man who whispered over the phone he couldn't speak because he was at the doctor's office. During this conversation, the man was in fact showing a house with clients while also being observed by investigators. With all this evidence in hand, the claim was denied. Total claim savings to MPI was nearly $110,000. <laughs> And Olaf, one huge snowman. The festive monument named Olaf, seen here in this picture, was to help cheer up people during the COVID-19 pandemic. The scarf is made of hockey socks. The hat is a 30 gallon steel drum. And the nose is a hanging basket painted orange. The snowman is located about one kilometer south of the Trans-Canada Highway down Road 87, approximately six kilometers west of the Carberry Junction. Rob is one of Carberry's curling gurus and manages the Sand Hills Golf Course Clubhouse during the summer, while Julie is an itinerant resource teacher with Beautiful Plains School Division. We have thought of this idea for several years but with the absence of curling and hockey, this was the time, Julie said. Olaf has been dismantled until next year, as of Sunday, January 3rd at 4 o'clock. And this says, Rob and Julie Van Comer of Carberry pose for a photo next to a giant snowman they built out of silage bales covered in white plastic, along with Shatner, a pit bull cross they got through funds for furry friends. Aww. Here and There by Gladwin Scott. Curl Manitoba Executive Director Craig Baker has confirmed the 2021 Provincial Championships have been cancelled. Provincial 2020 Curling Championship winners Kristen Karwacki and Derek Simigalski for mixed doubles, Jason Gunlickson for men's and, and Jennifer Jones for women's will represent Manitoba at the Nationals in Calgary. Carrie Einerson will also be competing as a 2020 National Women's Champion. Plans call for no fans and the curlers will be housed in a bubble in March. It's a special feeling to wear that Manitoba Buffalo on your back, stated a happy Derek Samogalski. To help celebrate Canada's 150th anniversary, the Manitoba Curling Hall of Fame decided to select its 150 top rinks they then ranked the top 25 most notable curling rinks as determined by a group of media, volunteers, and committee members. Top ranking 
went to Jennifer Jones of St. Vitale, 2005 to 2020, who won six national women's titles and two world championships. The number two ranked team was Dawn Duguid of Granite, who captured world men's crowns in 1970 and 71. Carberry skip Braden Calvert's Deer Lodge squad won two Canadian and one world junior title in 2014 and 15 to be ranked 14th. Derek Samogalski is second for skip Mike McEwen, 2008 to 18, who finished 22nd. Carberry's Ab Gowenlux 1938 foursome was selected 23rd while Oakville's Joan Ingram of Fort Gary, 1967 to 73, rounded out number 25. Peter Nichols, MCHOF president, made the announcement. Reverend Ken Moffat, who grew up in the Gregg district and has been a longtime resident of Thunder Bay, Ontario, will celebrate his 95th birthday in April. He was our minister when we were married almost six de decades ago in Hamiota. When in the Westman area, Ken played baseball with a strong Arrow River tournament team and also practiced with coach Frank McKinnon's Hamiota senior hockey team, although I'm not sure if he ever made the starting lineup. However, distance running was his forte. He won many marathons even when he was in his 80s, although he humbly admitted to be the only competitor in several events. <laughs> Former Carberry United Church Minister Peggy Reed has continued to preach from Hillsborough, New Brunswick via Facebook since mid-March and has a wide viewing from St. John's, Newfoundland to Canmore and Wainwright, Alberta plus Miramichi, New Brunswick. Always energetic Peggy did spend two years in Africa, Nigeria, and Ghana, and along with husband Dennis Single of Waldersea, helped initiate a handbell choir in New Brunswick. Her mother-in-law, Edna Sing Single, resides in Nipois Country Meadows. A welcome resident at Minidosa Care Home. There's a picture of Gaylene Stimpson. Gaylene Stimson, the eldest of our four sisters, entered the Minidosa Personal Care Home as a permanent resident in late August. Personal Care Home residents and staff have discovered Gaylene as a welcome addition to her new home. Confined to a wheelchair, she has not lost her desire to help people. A talented musician, she has played the piano for musical entertainment, which is appreciated by most of the personal care home residents. They enjoy listening, singing, clapping their hands and tapping their toes for Christmas and old favorites. At least once or twice each week in December, the residents congregate for a personal care home sing song. Gaylene spent most of her 35 year teaching career at Strathclair, where she was deeply involved in community activities. Always involved in music, a love she inherited from our parents, Jim and Merle Scott, Gaylene played the piano for the Starlight Serenaders, a popular Westman dance band. Stimson was also a leader in the Strathclair Community Marching Band, who participated in local fair parades and had a popular exchange with a band from Havixbeck, Germany. Her majorette team was always a part of numerous community performances. Festival performances were also a highlight. Some of her dance groups were award winners, especially great Craig Geeky and his partner Toby Martin, his future wife, who excelled in the lively Charleston dance. She was also a staunch Legion supporter as her husband Merv joined the Royal Canadian Navy as a teenager and served on the Algonquin destroyer during the Battle of the Atlantic in World War II. It was their dangerous task to protect Canadian troop ships from German submarines traveling between Canada and Britain. She and her son, Dana, and daughter-in-law, Mary Jane of Clarny, were among the first people to be able to use the visitor pod on December 15th, a recent addition to the Minidosa Personal Care Home. And our last piece of the Nipua banner is a community profile on Hannah Ramsey. 
Hannah Ramsey, age 17, is a member of the 2021 Carberry Collegiate graduating class who has excelled in the local and step in time dance programs. My first involvement with, with Hannah was in Brenda Hoffer's grade four pen pal project. She was a very good writer eight years ago and still has fun in Donica McDonald's English class. Chemistry, pre-calculus, math and phys ed are her other first term classes. Biology is one of her, for her favorites next term. This would explain why she has applied to Brandon University for a biomedical program next year. Dance is her forte, studying tap, jazz, ballet, lyrical, and modern versions. Competitions were held in Winnipeg and Regina. She did volunteer to help Taylor Orchard with local dance classes for three years. For six years, Hannah has enjoyed 13 hours each week of Step in Time Brandon classes. For four years, she has served as a Carberry Collegiate Peer Mentor in individuals who have had a positive influence on Hannah are her parents, Brian and Annie, and her Step in Times instructors, instructors. Every day after school, she works at the family business, Ramsey Motors GM. And that does it for this week's uh, edition of the Nipah Banner and Press. Thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.